I hope you're ready for another great week of business statistics with your instructor, Dr. Todd Day. Welcome, everyone, to week three of our basic business statistics course. I'm Todd Daniel, and uh, we're going to talk this week about the qualitative and quantitative data, the continuous and categorical data that we learned about in week one, and how we can describe that data using descriptive statistics. So we should start off by answering the question, what are descriptive statistics? Well, if I ask you to describe a person, you would use words like tall or friendly or outgoing. Um, if I ask you to describe a place, you might say that it is quiet or cold or sunny. If I ask you to describe data, we have really two ways of doing that. We can use numbers, which we tend to put into tables because tables help to organize the numbers. Or we can make pictures, which we call charts, or sometimes we call graphs, two words for the same thing. Our options for describing data are numbers and pictures. And we do different numbers or pictures depending on whether we have categorical or quantitative data. So if we have categorical data, we're gonna be using things like a frequency table with a bar graph. And if we have quantitative data, we'll use things like a frequency table with a histogram. And these things are very similar. And I'll show you how to do this both in Excel and in JASP. So we're going to start talking about frequency distributions. And then we'll create a frequency distribution and we'll do that both for categorical data and for continuous or quantitative data. What is a frequency distribution? Frequency is a descriptive statistic and it tells us how often a score occurs in a distribution. How many times do we see that same score occurring? A distribution is just a general name that we use for an organized set of data. In this example, I have a frequency table. And you can see across the headers of that table, we have scores and the second column labeled with an F. That's simple frequency. If you wanted to know how many times does 17 occur in this data set, the frequency of 17 is one. There is one score of 17 in this distribution. There are two scores of 16, and there are six scores for 14. That's simple frequency. How many times does this score occur in our distribution? I want to refresh you on the dog toys data set that I mentioned in week one. It's a data set that I made up. And it is a survey that we did of 50 dogs. And we asked them things like, how many toys do you own? We asked them to choose their favorite toy out of five. We identified the dog breed, which we just generally classified as retrievers, fuzzy dogs, and chihuahuas based mostly on the fact that those are the kind of dogs that I have around my house and they're easy to take videos of. We made note of their size, small, medium, large. That's our ordinal variable. They, re they received a prize. A, a, they got to choose which toy would you like to take with you as a thank you for completing the survey. And they got to choose, choose one of those three. And then we kept track of how long it took for them to chew the stuffings out of that toy, to destroy the toy, and we recorded that as days to fail. In another setting, we could collapse our five favorite toys into groups of three based upon similarity, and I'll use that for a different example. Those are the data points for our dog toys data set, and I'll just use that as an example for the histograms and the frequency tables that I'll be creating, showing you here. This data set is available on Blackboard, so you can also download that and you can follow along and you can do this yourself. When we have data, there are generally two questions that we want to answer. Let's say that one day I showed up at your office and for no good reason other than just to illustrate this concept, I took my bag and I dumped out on your desktop a bunch of poker chips. So I have these poker chips and they're now just 
laying on your desktop, you might have two questions. You, you might have more than two, but the two that I'm going to answer are, how many poker chips are on your desktop? How many do we have? And you'll probably also want to know how many of them are blue, how many of them are red, how many of them are green. So our two questions. How many, that is the total number of poker chips that we have in our distribution. The how often is the frequency. How often does each color occur in our distribution? Now where this is going to lead us is probability. In other words, if I put these poker chips in the bag and shake them up, in the, uh, in the, in the days before, I, I used to have someone pick a chip for me. Uh, I'll just have to do it myself for this example. Uh, so trust that I'm just picking blindly. But if you were to have to guess which color poker chip I'm going to choose from the bag, what would be your best guess? Probably the red because there's more of those than anything else and I'll just pick one and it was red. Now, it didn't have to be red, it could have been a different color, but there was a greater probability of choosing red because there were more red chips in the bag. So we will then lead from things like simple frequency into probability when it comes to selection or sample. So let me drill down on these ideas, the N and the F, the two letters that we're going to be using as we describe simple frequency. N, capital N, is the notation for sample size, how many scores we have, which would be how many participants, how many people completed our survey, or in the case of the, one that, the data set that we're using, how many dogs completed our survey. It's the number of cases or participants or subjects. If 32 people answered your survey, you have an N32. In this case, there are 24 poker chips in the bag. We have an N of 24. When you want to know how often red occurs or how many of the 32 people answered yes, now we're getting into questions of frequency. We will use the letter F, the lowercase f. You can either italicize it, or there is a, an option for this really cool looking F, which at least on the Mac is an option F to get this. But you could just use a lowercase f. That is the notation for frequency. It's how often a score occurs. Of the 32 people who completed your survey, 20 of them said yes to item one. That would mean that 12 said no to item one, giving you your total of 32 for the total number of people that participated. And the frequency of yes is 20 and the frequency of no is 12. In the poker chip example, there are 14 red poker chips, seven blue, three green. We use the capital N to stand for the whole sample size, but if I was referring to, let's say, the frequency of the green poker chips, I would use a lowercase n and say n equals three for green. So what we can do now is take this frequency distribution idea and we can apply this to our categorical data. And we'll start with simple frequency, which is simply the number of times that a score occurs. All we do is just count up the number in the distribution that gives us the simple frequency. And we'll put this into a table where we have columns of data. The first column, the X column, will be the, the actual scores. And then we will follow that with a column, which we'll label with an F, and that's going to be the frequency for that particular data point. The sum of all of the frequencies equals N, capital N. If you add up the total of yes and no, 20 plus 12, you get the total number of people that participated in your survey, 32. If you add up the total frequencies for red and green and blue, you end up with the total number of poker chips in this sample. So N can be described as the sum of F. Add up all the frequencies and you get to your sample size. Here's how you would do this in Excel. Now what I've done is simplified the dog toys data set. I've just pulled out the favorite toy category. I've just had this one variable. I copied and pasted that onto a new sheet. 
To create a frequency table in Excel, the first thing that you have to do is find all of the categories in your variable and then cut and paste those category names into their own column. So here I have stuffed monkey, rope bone, chirpy bird, chew toy, and tennis ball. I've copied and pasted those out of the existing data. Then you create your frequency using the count if function. Remember, functions always begin with an equal sign, so it's equal sign count if. And then we have two arguments. We have the range and the criteria. So if we were to put this into English, we would say, look at the range of data from A2 to A51 and count if the criteria matches stuffed monkey. And we would copy that down, so we would say the same thing. Look in this range of data, count how many times you see rope bone. And those frequencies are appearing here in this second column. The formulas are there for your benefit, so you can see how I created these. Remember that if you create a formula, let's see. once you've created that formula, you can copy it down. You don't have to recreate it every single time. You can just copy it down to the remaining empty cells. But if you're going to do that, you want to use an absolute reference. In other words, you always want the range to be A2 to A51. And to accomplish that, you use a dollar sign in front of the A and the, and the 2, and then in front of the A and the 51. The last point here is I added up a total, which I just use a sum for that. So the sum of D2 to D6 gives me 50. That's how many participants there were in my survey. That's how you create a simple frequency. When we put this into a table with APA style, it would look like this. And we'll continue to add to this table, and at the end you'll see the completed table, completed frequency table. That's what we're trying to arrive at. Second frequency is relative frequency, which is a proportion of the number of times that a score occurs in your distribution. A proportion is a number between 0 and 1. So it's going to be a decimal. Proportions are always less than 1, greater than 0. And the way that we get a relative frequency is we divide our simple frequency by n, by our total. Well, this is also easy enough to do in Excel. I've moved over one column. I've added a relative frequency column. And the formula is frequency divided by total. So I don't need a, a new, uh, I don't need a formula for this. I can just type it myself. I would type an equal sign. And in cell E2, I would select the frequency, which would be in D2, and divide that by the total. But I want to be sure that I put the absolute reference around, put the dollar signs around that absolute reference for the total, so that as I use this formula over and over again, it will always refer to the cell immediately to its left, but it will always divide by 50. That's where those dollar signs are coming in. So I have D2 divided by 50. That creates a relative frequency of 0.2. And I can drag that formula down to copy it through all of those cells. To add that absolute reference, to add those dollar signs, there are a couple shortcuts that you want to know about. This makes it really simple. Let's say, let's say you type A2, but you want to have a dollar sign in front of the A and the 2. If you are using a PC, then type, you just type the A2 and then hit F4 on your keyboard. If you're using a Mac, you type the A2, and use command T. It will add those dollar signs. By default, it adds the dollar signs in front of the A and the 2. But if you wanted only in front of A or only in front of 2, you could continue to press either F4 or command T to toggle through those options. So now I've added the relative frequency to my table. And we can see those numbers appearing in the second column. But we have one remaining column, still blank. That is the percent frequency, and that's actually very closely related to relative frequency. Let me show you how. Percent frequency is the relative frequency multiplied by 100 to create a percentage. The simplest way to get there is just to multiply the relative frequency by 100, and we can do that in Excel. The formula is 
refer to the relative frequency and multiply by 100, so it's equal sign, E2 times 100. And then I could drag that formula, fill in the rest of the cells. But what you will notice in this percent frequency is those are just numbers. It's a 20 and an 18. They don't say percent. They don't have the percent sign attached to them. If you want that percent sign, which I tend to like, here's the way that I would do this. Instead of multiplying by 100, I would just reference what was in the relative frequency cell. So I would just use, in the first case, E2. And having copied the relative frequency into that percent frequency column, I would then go to my number layout and I would choose percentage. Now I have the percentages, I have that percent sign added to my percent frequency. That is how we would show a categorical variable using tables and numbers. Of course, our other option is we can use a picture or a graph or a chart to represent our categorical data. The type of graph that we're going to use for categorical data is a bar graph or a bar chart. Used with categorical data, we will also see something called a histogram. It looks very similar, but it is different. Here's the distinction. In a bar graph, the bars do not touch. So you could think of prison bars. They're individual bars, right? They don't touch each other. With a histogram, those bars are next to each other. And what this indicates, by the bars not touching, it indicates that the data are categorical. Essentially, they could be rearranged in a different order, and it wouldn't change anything <coughs> fundamental about the graph. It might actually make it easier to interpret. And that is what a Pareto diagram or Pareto chart is. This is where we arrange the bars in descending order of magnitude, such that we put the tallest bar first. It often shows the, the most frequently chosen or the most important category. And then we have a decreasing order following that tallest bar. Well, here's an example of what a Pareto chart would look like using a data set that I didn't really make up, I just found and copied. It was the number of deaths in Shakespeare. What is the bloodiest Shakespearean play? How, what is the, the, the play in which the most number of people die? I would have guessed King Lear. Uh, it's certainly the most gruesome of all the plays with the blinding of Gloucester and the other things that happen. Uh, but it turns out that actually the bloodiest Shakespearean play is Titus Andronicus. We see that by it being the tallest bar on the left. And as we move to the right, the bars in descending order. So now you can see a much cleaner comparison. And the, the least um, among these bars would be uh, Timon of Athens. And you can see where Hamlet and Macbeth fall in reference to all of the other plays based upon the number of deaths that occur in that play. This is also called a bard graft. How else can we display categorical data? We could use a pie chart. A pie chart looks like this. There are some things to know about the proper use of a pie chart. If you're going to use a pie chart, it can represent one of two things. It could be percentages or proportions, but it needs to be something that adds up to 100. So you really shouldn't use counts. You should use percentages in a pie chart. A good rule is a maximum of five categories. You start getting more than five, it gets cluttered, it gets junky, it gets harder and harder to interpret. You should start the initial slice at 12 o'clock. It moves clockwise, representing the proportion of the scores. And you would color them or shade them from darker to lighter. It's our first pie slice is the darkest becomes lighter as it moves around that circle. So those are the rules for the proper use of a pie chart. But before you make a pie chart, there are some things you should consider. Number one, a pie chart works better with smaller numbers of categories, two or three categories. Uh, if you have a, a fairly even split between, let's say, males and females in your data set, the pie chart can give you a a quick indicator of are there more of one or the other group. Adding the third category, 
you can still tell something. But the worst pie charts are the ones where you have 95% of the scores in one slice, and then all of the remainders are just these tiny little slices. That gives you nothing to go on as far as making good comparisons between those data points. Edward Tufte, one of his tweets said this, pie chart users deserve the same suspicion or skepticism as those who mix up its and its, or there and there. To compare, use a little table or sentences, not pies. Here's the problem with pie charts. They tend to be difficult to interpret because they tend to distort the data. That is because when you're looking at the pie slice, you're comparing in two dimensions, whereas if you're comparing the height of the bars, you're comparing only one dimension, just the height. Much easier to compare the height of the bars than the area of a pie slice. So I would encourage you to avoid using pie charts. I always use bar charts. Uh, very, very rarely do I use pie charts um, if I can possibly avoid it, unless someone has re specifically requested one. Very rarely would I ever use a pie chart. So I would discourage the use of pie charts. Now there may be others who don't have as strong of feelings about pie charts as I do, and they might disagree, and that's okay. But here is one that we can all agree on, and that is never use the 3D option for a pie chart in Excel, because this horribly distorts the data. As I've created here, a pie chart of 25% for each of these categories. So we know these are equally sized categories, but look what happens when we use that 3D option. It distorts the data terribly, and now even though this smaller blue pie we know is the same size as the red toward the front, this one looks so much larger. So this is a, a terrible distortion of the data. And regardless of whether you choose to use a pie chart, never use that 3D option. It's, it's not a good way to display data. Now I showed you how to create a frequency table and a, a bar chart and a pie chart in Excel. And I promised that I would also show you how to do all of these in JASP. Here's what you would do. I have included the Dog Toys 2 uh, Excel file. It's actually a, I'm sorry. I have included the Dog Toys 2 Excel file, which if you're going to use it in JASP, your first step should be to copy it or save it in Excel as a CSV. So save it as a comma delimited file. Just save it to the desktop. Once it's on the desktop, you can open JASP and you can go from the main menu to uh, open computer desktop and you'll find the CSV click on that it opens it up in JASP and now we're ready to use the descriptives menu in order to create our frequency table and our bar chart and I'll also show you the pie chart so here's what you would do step one all of our variables are in this left box we're going to use favorite toy as our variable we'll simply move that into the variables box. That's step one. Because this is a nominal variable, we can select frequency tables for nominal and, ordinal, nominal and ordinal variables. If we had a scale variable, it simply would not create a frequency table for that variable. And that frequency table will appear in our output. Then under plots, we can choose distribution plot. That is what will create the bar chart. If the values like Chew Toy and Chirpy Bird are, are too packed together, you can just adjust the width of that bar chart and it will automatically update and it will give you a nicer looking chart. We can also choose pie charts in this very same option. So click on distribution plots and pie charts. That completes the analysis. If we have a scale variable, as opposed to a nominal variable, when we choose distribution plots, it will automatically give us a histogram instead of a bar chart. So JASP knows the level of measurement, and it gives you the chart that is appropriate to that level of measurement. And that's how we do it. So it's a simple move a variable, click a few boxes. We will get our frequency table. Notice here we have frequency and percent. 
We don't have relative percents, although we could calculate that. We could copy this table into Excel and create a relative percent. Honestly, or, sorry, relative frequency. Honestly, I find percent to be a much, much more usable uh, way of describing the data. Uh, we also have cumulative percent. I'm going to talk to you about cumulative percent. It works better with, uh, let's say, ordinal variables, because there's an underlying order, uh, to accumulate the number of, of nominal categories isn't necessarily that, that useful. Uh, but we do get the cumulative percent regardless of whether we use nominal or ordinal. Below this, we see the bar chart for each of the types of toys. And the pie chart, by default, comes out in color. Uh, that is because the default setting for JASP is to use uh, what is called the colorblind color scheme. In other words, it's, it's a color scheme that is easier to see if you are colorblind. APA style, however, calls for grayscale. And so you simply click on the color palette and replace gray as your palette, and that will change this pie chart to the grayscale that we need for publication.